Hi, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am U.S. Policy Manager and Global Policy Counsel at Access Now. To my immediate right is Kurt Offsall, who is General Counsel and Deputy Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And to his right is Kevin Bankston, who is the Executive Director of the Open Technology Institute at New America, which I probably said wrong, and I apologize. Um, so today we're going to talk about Rule 41, which is a rule of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, and it specifically involves issues about when a magistrate judge can issue a warrant, which sounds really, really boring. Um, I promise you it won't be. This is really just a panel um, kind of about government hacking and what the U.S. is doing to make it possible to engage in hacking operations. And so I'm immediately going to turn it over to Kevin, who's going to give some background on how we got to the fact that there are going to now be changes to Rule 41 and what really happened to lead us here. Sure. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Scott. Um, thank you, everyone. On a personal note, it's wonderful to be here. My first speaking gig when I went to work at EFF, where Kurt works now, uh, was here at Dragon Con. So, so thank you for being digital civil liberties engaged nerds. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. I am one myself. Um, so uh, how do we get here? Um, first off, if you want a really good overview of what we know factually about law enforcement hacking, I recommend Googling for a great story by Kim Zetter at Wired. Just Google for Kim Zetter and FBI hacking and you'll get a lot of this information uh, from there. But this story, as far as the public knows, um, started in 2007, actually, when we first heard about the government hacking into criminals' computers to try and discover their location. There was a case in Washington where someone was uh, issuing bomb threats to a local school, and this, this kid got pretty cheeky. He actually started a My, MySpace profile back when there were such things, um, where he was issuing these threats. But he was accessing that My, MySpace page through some sort of anonymizing proxy, so the FBI couldn't get logs from MySpace that would reveal who this person was. So they sent him a fake message over MySpace. They did a phishing attack on him, so he clicked the wrong link and downloaded malware from the government, something at that time that was called a CPAV, a Computer Internet Protocol Address Verifier, which would then leak the IP address back to the government so they could arrest him. He was ended up being a student at the school. Um, but this was news to us, and this was reporting done also by Wired back in 2007. This was the first time we'd heard about the government hacking into a suspect's computer secretly to find something out about them. Often the thing they're trying to find out is, what's the IP address of this person who's using an anonymizing proxy? Um, so what we didn't know and didn't learn until 2009, based on some great FOIA work by Wired, uh, they're big heroes in this story, they, they uncovered a variety of memos about this method, including one from 2002 about this technique saying, hey guys, let's be careful not to overuse this. And that was 15 years ago, basically. So 15 years ago, the FBI was already using this technique enough that they needed a memo warning them not to overuse it. Um, and yet we didn't even know it existed in 2000, until 2007. And so after that, we knew that this was happening. We didn't know details because you know, the warrant applications are made to these magistrates in secret, and maybe occasionally some a little information would come out in a criminal case, but, but rarely. Um, and so, so often in, th in these types of issues uh, around surveillance and the government asking judges for stuff is we need to wait for one of the more activist judges to actually a publish a decision about what the government is doing and hopefully even denying what the government is doing and explaining why. And that's what happened in 2013 with a judge named uh, Judge Stephen Smith in Houston, who was a previous privacy hero for outing the government's use of cell phone tracking back in 2005. So this is a guy who's made it a practice, lucky for us, of occasionally publishing opinions about, hey, the government asked me for this wacky thing, I'm worried about it, I'm gonna deny it and publish an, uh, an opinion saying why. And that's what happened here in 2013. Um, someone's email account got hacked into, which led to hacking into their bank account and some attempted fraud related to that. And the government wanted to find out who this person was, but he was using some sort of anonymizing proxy. So they went to Judge Smith and said, hey, we would like you to issue a search warrant that allows us to uh, use this network investigative technique, that's one of their uh, euphemisms for this, um, that will allow us to intrude on the computer. We will intrude on the computer and install this software that would amongst other things, allow us to search the hard drive, turn on the, the camera, 
uh, you know, use any location services it might have to locate it, uh, send back the IP address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what Judge Smith said was, well, gee, guys, I'm not sure this is constitutional under the Fourth Amendment for a variety of reasons we'll probably talk about. But even before we get there, I'm looking at this Rule 41. This is the rule of federal criminal procedure that governs how magistrates can issue search warrants. It's sort of building off of the Fourth Amendment's requirements that there be warrants based on probable cause and particularly describing what's getting searched and seized. And he says, I'm looking at Rule 41, and it says, except for a few specific exceptions like terrorism cases, I can only issue warrants for property that is in my district. And yet you're telling me you don't know where this computer is. So how can I issue a warrant for a computer when I don't know where it is? So I'm going to deny this application. Which brings us to the past few years where in 2014 the Justice Department went to, and I always have to look this thing up, uh, went to the Advisory Committee on the Rules of Criminal Procedure, which is this advisory committee uh, of judges and scholars and other lawyers who come up with recommendations for rule changes um, that then get transmitted to the Supreme Court and then eventually approved by Congress in a, in a passive way. We'll get more on that. And, and DOJ went to this advisory committee and said, here are some proposed rules to deal with this problem that Judge Smith has started for us, where now judges are going to start saying, hey, wait, we can't issue these, these remote access search or network investigative technique or, let's just call it, government hacking warrants. So that brings us to the current controversy over how and whether to change Rule 41. So, Kurt, can you tell us a little bit about the rule changes that were proposed to Rule 41 and what the government is seeking to do and why that's a problem? Uh, sure, sure. So, uh, to give a little bit uh, uh, of just uh, some overview of what it is, uh, Rule 41, it's the, well, it's the 41st rule in the rules of <coughs> criminal procedure. Um, and these are rules that are generally very uh, procedural, you know, how to uh, operate the court system, uh, how long a brief can be, uh, what what days the court will be closed on. Uh, it's generally not supposed to be uh, particularly substantive. Um, so I mean, they can have substantive effects. I guess if you you know if you want to write a longer brief and it won't allow it, that that may have effects. But it's it's really a procedural set of rules. Uh, and so one of the things that that is strange about this is that uh, the government was proposing doing a more substantive change within that set of rules. Um, and so well, Rule 41 deals with uh, magistrate judges and uh, how, how to go about uh, getting and issuing uh, a warrant. And again, it was starting out being somewhat uh, just sort of the nuts and bolts of, of how you go about doing this uh, and not really about the uh, expanding the scope of, of jurisdiction. But that is, uh, that is just what it does. It does actually two major changes to, uh, to the existing Rule 41. Uh, the first part is uh, granting the authority uh, that, that Judge Smith uh, uh, didn't, said he didn't have uh, to issue a warrant anywhere uh, for a computer that is located uh, anywhere. So it's sort of widely increasing the, the power of, of magistrate judges. And the, the trigger for this is whether uh, their, their location has been uh, obscured. Uh, and, and this uh, uh, may seem like something nefarious going on, but uh, actually there are a wide range of technologies uh, that will uh, obscure locations that are routinely used. So uh, VPNs, virtual private networks, uh, almost everybody who is, is working for a, uh, a company will have a VPN to get back to their co corporate uh, servers while they're traveling on the, on the road. Uh, for those who are, are trying to protect their privacy online, they might use the Tor browser. Um, these, these tools are commonly used uh, not just by ordinary people, but also uh, in, in uh, sensitive situations, like if you were a journalist, uh, who was uh, uh, trying to be a bit subtle in what you were doing online or uh, overseas. Uh, these tools are often used by uh, activists who uh, have reason to uh, uh, be concerned if, the, if, if their own government uh, finds out about the location. So it, it turns out to be a, a trigger for this expansion of powers that could affect uh, uh, a large number of people who are just trying to, to shield their privacy. Uh, and the second part of the change uh, was designed to, to go after uh, botnets. So a botnet 
uh, is a, a series of computers that have been affected with uh, malware. Uh, and uh, there's actually probably uh, millions and upon millions of computers that have this where the people don't even know it. I've, I've seen uh, something suggesting that up to 30% uh, of computers around the world have uh, a, a malware infection uh, of some sort. Uh, and the, the botnets string together a whole bunch of these computers and then have it do tasks. So, you know, very commonly uh, they're used to, uh, to send some spam or to do a distributed denial of service attacks where every computer on the botnet all tries to access a, uh, a web server all at the same time in order to uh, pretty much shut down that, that server. So, you know, botnets are, are a bit problematic. Uh, and you can see why the government would be uh, would be interested in, in doing something about it, but they are also hacking upon the innocent people, the people who were themselves victimized uh, by by the malware, and now the, these rules would uh, uh, authorize uh, the government to go in and then do a second attack on on these computers to to get into it. And uh, this this is concerning not. Uh, just for the uh, uh, civil liberties interests, though those are strong. There's a lot of private things somebody could have on their computer that you, they wouldn't. Uh, 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 there wouldn't be a good Fourth Amendment uh, compliant reason for the government to to go to uh, in the ordinary course. But also because uh, the government doesn't have a particularly good history of doing it well. Uh, so that some of the uh, malware, uh, you know, the network intrusion tools, the NITs that uh, Kevin was talking about, uh, have have opened up these computers to further problems uh, that they may be transmitting information from that computer back to the government in the clear so that if someone is observing the network uh, things that have previously been encrypted are now being sent uh, back to the government in the clear and make them easier for, for someone else to target uh, you know by sort of busting their way in the door they may be leaving the door open for other people who are coming by and there's not really a good check and balance on this one of the things that is a sort of continuing trouble uh, in uh, uh, the application of uh, the, the government to use these network intrusion tools is the judges really don't know the technology very well. They have a tremendous amount of institutional trust in, uh, in prosecutors who will say, well, we've got this magic technology and you just need to authorize us to do it here. Sign here and we'll take care of the rest. Uh, and there's not really a good uh, check that's happening by the judges for the most part. Uh, on whether these tools are, are only getting the things that they're looking for, whether they're going to operate well, whether they're uh, going to go beyond the scope uh, of the order, and very little ways for the magistrate really to even figure it out if things do go awry. Uh, and so these changes were proposed to uh, the, uh, the advisory committee. Uh, the advisory committee adopted these changes, and uh, there's another sort of arcane rule of how this, this works. Uh, is uh, it, it is done mostly by the judiciary, but Congress has the opportunity to say something. So if Congress does nothing, then on December 1st, these rules go into effect. Uh, however, if Congress says something, or that is to say, if Congress passes a law, they can put a stop to these changes. And so that's sort of where we are right now. There is a, a bill that has been uh, proposed uh, by Senator Ron Wyden. Uh, there's, a, there's a House version as well, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the House version? Uh, that are currently before Congress. Um, it, it is much easier to get Congress to not do something than it is to get Congress to do something. Um, and so because of the default being that the rules go into effect unless Congress does something, uh, this is, this is going to be a tough job. Uh, but uh, uh, my organization and others uh, uh, have uh, been trying to uh, uh, push for people to uh, get in touch with their representatives, let the, the Congress uh, uh, and Senator, Congress people and senators know about this, and see if we can get that bill to move forward. Uh, and we have a question, or did you want to? Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, have, um, has, um, has the Congress done anything to make this So come. Confidently, I can say that Congress has not done a lot this year. Um, this bill has been introduced. It's actually called the SMH Act. Um, I don't Stop even remember what they Stop mass, mass hacking. hacking. All I remember is SMH because it's short for Internet Slang for Smack My Head. Um, it's 
it, Congress just isn't acting this year. I don't know if they don't want to, um, but they have been out a lot because in election years they typically go and electioneer for their compatriots. Um, well, and so. Um, some of these representatives who are up for re-election, um, people like y'all um, are getting the, te the, the, tech, the IT people to talk to their representatives about these things. Uh, you know, say, you know, if you don't want to vote, if you don't want to vote for this, then I'm going to, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the next person, the next person who will. So I'm kind of surprised they're not doing anything um, because it's an election year. So I just there are a lot of arguments against this. Um, I, I, let me turn to Kevin. Kevin, why don't you talk a little bit because we, you were with me when I testified um, to the rules committee, to the advisory committee previously. What arguments is Cong has the, did the advisory committee hear? What arguments is Congress now hearing? And why do you think that they're not acting um, in order to shut this down? Well, I mean, to sort of set the state, I mean, the current Congress doesn't act speaking generally. Like it, it is in gridlock, it doesn't get things done. Um, often surveillance issues are an interesting strange bedfellows area where far left and far right can get together and sort of pull some from the middle and make something happen. Uh, we saw that with uh, the USA Freedom Act uh, surveillance reform bill uh, last year. But um, the, the event that uh, Amy speaks, at, it speaks of, this was when the committee was accepting testimony from people about these rules. Um, and it was really quite a scene. Uh, it was in DC and it like, my organization was there, Amy's organization was there, the ACLU was there, the Electronic Privacy Information Center was there, like every privacy and surveillance group like that you could, you know, it, if you could name them, they, they were there testifying about this rule. And I, I mean, I, I, I can best speak to my, my take on the rule, but this will also go to why it's hard to get Congress to act on this because Law enforcement does have a legitimate problem here. There are going to be many cases where criminals are using proxies in the commission of a crime such that law enforcement cannot identify them and cannot even identify where they are. Um, so one could understand a narrow rule focused on that issue that said something like, if you don't know because they're obscuring their location, you can go to a judge that has a jurisdiction has jurisdiction over the crime and do an intrusion strictly limited to finding where they are and nothing else. And then once you've figured out where they are, go to that court and get the full warrant. Um, but that's not what this did. This basically just gives them carte blanche to go to any court with jurisdiction of the crime um, without those kinds of limits. Um, and this is very important, especially because of the scope of intrusion that's p possible when you break into somebody's computer. I mean, our entire lives are on those machines. And, and, and you, know, we, you know, we and the Founding Fathers looked at searches as things where you really wanted to be very particular about what the government could look at and what they could search and seize. But in the real world, we also have this thing called the plain view rule where like if they have a warrant to bust into your house for one thing, but then they see some other illegal thing, they can, they can use that against you. And the question is, how does that apply in the digital world? And so without answering any of those questions or really grappling with the other hard questions like, well, gee, this is very different from other searches because it can destroy the system. It can harm the system. It can open it up to other attacks. It could spread to other computers of innocent people. Without Congress ever talking about or thinking about how or whether to regulate this or allow it at all, you have this supposedly procedural law that's going to bless the entire idea while also giving them a wide um, amount of authority in terms of getting these warrants. I'll, I'll address your question in a minute, sir. Um, but then again, even if you had a narrow rule to address their legitimate problem, that doesn't explain this crazy botnet thing, um, which is why we call the bill the Stop Mass Hacking Act. Because as Kurt said, you know, we have estimates close to a third of the computers on the freaking planet um, are infected by some kind of botnet. Um, and yet this would allow them to hack into any of those computers. And the part that's worrying about that isn't just the fact that it would allow them to intrude on and search those computers. We actually have people from the government saying things about 
yes, we're going to use this to actively disrupt botnets, like to actually intentionally cause damage to those systems, which is not something we think search warrants can allow at all. They're, they're search warrants. They're not like search and destroy uh, warrants. Um, so we made all of these arguments, but, but speaking generally, the, the committee was not friendly to our perspective and did feel that, look, we're just, we're just addressing a jurisdictional procedural issue. We're not blessing these searches. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's a separate question of law and courts are still uh, free to say, like, we think this warrant application is unconstitutional, for example. And what we're doing here won't impact that. And when you go to Congress, we do have this strange bedfellow coalition of right wing and left wing, uh, you know, rights oriented members who are supporting this. But even on a good day, you know, it's hard to get something passed. It's even harder to get something passed in six months on a really complex issue that no one knows about and where the FBI actually does have a legitimate, like, problem that they want solved. Um, that doesn't mean there's no hope. I think it's going to be very, very hard to get Congress to stop this rule change. But I also think that the conversation that this is allowing us to start is the first step down the road of having Congress actually hold hearings on what is going on, learn what is going on, start to think about how it wants to regulate this, much like it you know, regulated wiretapping 40 years ago. Because just like wiretapping, this hacking stuff raises a whole bunch of new threats and new concerns that, that traditional searches don't. So I was going to ask Kurt a little bit about wiretapping and Title III and what has happened in Congress previously when they came up with a more invasive than normal search. Um, and why it's interesting that there's a procedural change happening to bless a substantive issue. Um, but there are questions. So before we get to that, I wanted to go to you guys and see back there. No, it doesn't have to go through a committee. I mean, well, oh, oh, the, the Stop Mass Hacking Act, the reform bill, um, that, would be, that would be going through judiciary which are in the House is run by Good Latin and in the Senate is run by Grassley, neither of whom are interested in moving a bill. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And have, uh, has anything been done with the oversight? Like has anybody reached out to oversight? They love to have hearings on overreach, um, they love it. You know, uh, Representative Chaffetz's office is aware of this issue, he's not a co-sponsor of the bill. Um, we've had no luck in getting any hearings held yet. Um, you know, crossing our fingers there's that we, we will we will eventually get hearings, but there's a growing list of co-sponsors on the bill and a quickly diminishing number of days that we have where they are actually in session and able to pass a bill. I think it's less than right. 14 days yeah, now, now before December days. 1st that they're actually sitting in Congress and able to pass legislation. Um, so, Kurt, do you want to? Uh, sure, sure. So. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Title Three, and that's sort of a, as for many of these things, is a shorthand. I mean, it is Title Three of the Omnibus Crime Control uh, Bill from the from the '60s. Uh, but what it really ref uh, is about is uh, when, when faced with uh, the prospect of people listening in on phone calls, of government uh, prosecutors uh, uh, and uh, law enforcement listening in on phone calls, they decided that they wanted to have some additional rules uh, that they, the government would have to follow uh, when, when doing so. Things like uh, minimizing what they do. So if they listen to the call, you know, they're tapping the phone of the, of the mob boss and then it turns out to be it's the, it's the kid who's uh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, what he wants for Christmas or something that is clearly not uh, uh, relevant for their investigation, then they can end the call and listen in on the next one. So there are sort of rules to try and balance some of the privacy concerns that would come up from uh, the government listening to all of one's phone calls, uh, but also uh, giving uh, law enforcement this, this tool to uh, tap onto the wires and, uh, uh, and listen in. Uh, and so sometimes this is referred to as sort of like a super warrant. That is to say, of course, you still have to have the constitutional requirements for a warrant, 
but it has uh, also congressionally mandated additional rules. And this has happened actually from time to time in the uh, uh, search context, also for, for emails. There's the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which puts uh, some rules in place about uh, how uh, law enforcement can interact with email service providers. Uh, so there, there's been sort of a, a tradition of uh, uh, going beyond the constitutional mandate when there are sensitive and areas and having this go through uh, uh, legislation. And one of the good reasons for it to go through legislation is it allows the opportunity for uh, people to uh, you know, testify, present information, sort of the, the public to weigh in, uh, and then it has to muster enough votes to, to pass. Uh, as opposed to this uh, Rule 41 amendment procedure where there uh, uh, is, is not much going on in, in front of uh, Congress and you have to muster enough votes to, to stop it, uh, which sort of changes the, the paradigm. And one of the sort of the big problems with this is that the advisory committee thinks or says at least that uh, this is a procedural change, but it has uh, substantive effects. So in, in looking at that, one of the ideas that, uh, that we've had is maybe there should be something like a Title III super warrant uh, for hacking so that uh, uh, if the government wants to uh, uh, use a, uh, a network intrusion tool or malware uh, of some sort to get on some computer, that they have to uh, uh, not use more invasive uh, when, uh, not use invasive malware when more traditional methods would get you to the same location. So if you could uh, get to the same information using a standard investigative technique, then you shouldn't be using uh, malware to get you there. Uh, minimization, this is what I was talking about before, applied in the computer uh, context. So we have to identify what you're looking for and then go for that. Uh, as Kevin noted, uh, uh, our, our computers are our lives. Everything we do is on there and you know, it's not just some, some documents that we have, but like communications with our friends, our families, our social medias, all of our photos. Everything about your life is getting more and more documented, more and more placed on the computer. And a lot of that stuff is personal stuff that uh, is uh, really none of the government's business. Uh, and so by having minimization rules that would strictly narrow what they could get when they're, when they're in there uh, and try to address this, uh, this plain view tension that, uh, that could happen if the government can just root around the computer all that it wanted. Uh, including some uh, public reporting requirements so that we have a little bit more transparency on, on what is happening. For uh, traditional wiretaps listening to phone calls, uh, there's actual annual reports provided, how many uh, of these uh, wiretaps are issued by each jurisdiction, and you can go and, and take a look at those, and you can actually compare. A lot of companies also do transparency reports about ones that they have received, and you can compare them. Useful data, especially for those who are activists and civil libertarians, to be able to look at the volume, the scope of it, and see uh, uh, what, it, what has been going on. Um, and then also, uh, finally, uh, the, the judges should be able to, and in fact the government has, should be able to show, that there won't be uh, too many collateral effects. This is what I was getting at before, saying that you know, the government sometimes has done this badly. There's collateral harm that happens when their, their tool uh, breaks down a, a door and it might allow others to come in, might have effects on, on, on innocent people, and they should have to show the judge that uh, they are minimizing those col that collateral damage. Awesome. Are there any other questions? So disclosure. From what I understand, disclosure is kind of a big thing with what the EFF is pushing. Uh, whenever you're doing communications, there applies that to somebody who runs a service, them disclosing them. Is there any push that you can do with this particular rule to encourage uh, anybody who gets these kind of warrants to disclose? Or because I feel like if, if you were just able to have them put out a listing every single time they did it, they, there wouldn't be any well, uh, th this is one of the things that's actually super troubling about this. Uh, if you get a, uh, a Title III warrant to, uh, to listen on someone's phone calls, you take it to the phone company and you say, you know, uh, I need to listen into this number, and they put it in their transparency report, you know, add one to their, to their list of uh, wiretaps. With a hacking uh, uh, warrant, uh, that is given to the government. And the government doesn't go to any third party who might report it. Uh, the end user doesn't know. Well, okay, they might be using third party contractors. Uh, on the whole, my understanding is what they are doing is they are purchasing the tools um, 
you know, weaponized uh, exploits from third parties like Booz Allen, like many others. Uh, so if you're interested in this, this sort of thing, uh, there, there was an interesting article today in the New York Times about the NSO group, uh, which sells uh, all sorts of access tools or uh, high prices. Um, but uh, uh, they, they purchase them uh, and, and then use the, uh, the tool uh, rather than purchasing the service of getting on. Uh, but it's possible that model could change. I, I wanted to add a, a wrinkle here. You know, Kurt makes a fine point that uh, this is actually even more worrisome than wiretaps in the in the sense that there's not an intermediary intermediary who can act as a check or tell us that it's happening like we have with the phone companies and wiretapping. But actually, almost scarier is the alternative, which um, is something we are distinctly yeah, worried about, which is quickly. the government getting these warrants and then demanding the assistance of someone who provides you with software or your hardware. So say they go to Apple or Microsoft or whoever and then say, we want you through your software update process to ship malware to this target. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, in fact, I'm more than hopeful. I'm fairly certain that current law would not allow government to mandate companies to do that, but it is arguable that um, they could potentially try and mandate uh, a company to ship malware in this way. Uh, this was one of the reasons why we were also very concerned about what happened in the Apple versus FBI case around iPhones and backdoors into iPhones, which we'll be talking about tomorrow at 4 p.m. in the Sheraton in room A601-602. Um, and that's... That's also a good example of a potential double-edged sword if we do push to codify this. Um, although, speaking generally, I too uh, am wanting Congress to step in and regulate this. You have to re recognize that that is a political process, that there may end up being features of the law that you don't like. For example, some sort of broad assistance provision like what's in the Wiretap Act, uh, which in this context could be very damaging. Um, so it's. Honestly, it's an issue that our, our, our movement has wrestled with because no one wants to wants to like endorse government hacking, uh, but at the same time, they've been doing it for 15 years. They're going to keep doing it. It's not like Congress is going to tell them to stop doing it, but at least we could perhaps get Congress and or the courts through the Fourth Amendment to regulate it in some meaningful way. Yet, if we do that, that also entails its own risks. Um, yes, sir. There's a microphone. Um, hypothesizing for a second, if Congress were to block this rule change, which is unlikely, I grant, but if they were, what tools would there then be legally for law enforcement to pursue actual lawbreakers who are operating online bereft of these changes? You mean in terms of if, if they came upon someone who was obscuring their IP address? Correct. Um, so, Shut, please. So notably, there are two things. First of all, the Rule 41 only applies to magistrate judges. So full judges could still issue these warrants regardless of jurisdiction. Those limitations do not apply. Um, and so they can go to a full judge instead of going to a magistrate judge in order to have this rule or have these warrants issue. Um, the second thing is is to actually go through the rule amendment process as Kevin started with with a much more limited rule change looking for only to get that location information and so that that would require them it would scale back the breadth of the rule so it wouldn't allow as much activity but it would allow them to get the information that they have identified that they need in order to pursue these specific people these specific criminals um kevin did you no um other questions yes I was wondering after um, if a magistrate judge uh, issues the thing to, to do a search and it's determined the computer is outside the United States, how is that handled and hasn't there been a recent case to that? No. We don't know. In fact, um, Oren Kerr, who is an expert on this issue and who was on the advisory committee to pass the rule, um, and I have gone back and forth on this um, because I believe you would have to go through a process known as mutual legal assistance treaties. Um, in order to do that, and he believes you would have no process at all. Um, Kurt? Yeah, I, I, the same thing. I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, 
the way that you would do it, uh, I think, I think, is you, you go through a series of things. So you, you start with the first IP number you have, and then you go to the source of that IP number, and you use that to find who connected to that. And if it goes overseas, yeah, you can use the MLAT, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. Um, and uh, uh, the United States has uh, these mutual uh, treaties with... Uh, most countries, uh, I don't know if it's quite all of them, but most, uh, of them. most of them. And basically what that is, is uh, you, you just, uh, you go to the other country and say, hey, you know, we've got this problem. Uh, could you process uh, a request for information for us? And likewise, they can do the same. And so uh, from time to time, uh, you know, US service provider will get a subpoena for information about one of their customers that came from an MLAT out of another uh, country. Um, so I think you, you can follow these chains uh, and, and eventually get back to, uh, to a source. Um, the, uh, the, the government will tell you that, that this is too slow, uh, and in some cases it can be slow. Um, and the other, the other you know, ultimate issue, if it turns out that the final source, the actual person that you're looking for, is, uh, is, is overseas, well, whether you can do something about that depends on what jurisdiction that is, whether, what kind of treaties we have with them. Um, and you know, in, in some cases, uh, if you, if you trace the source back, you know, if it ends up if they're in North Korea, you know, there's not much you're going to be doing about that. So, uh, go ahead. There's a question. Oh, um, I wanted to raise another related set of issues to this issue um, that goes to the sort of the existence of an ecosystem for vulnerabilities. Like we live in a world where we have all these software tools and hardware tools. And because humans are fallible and these things are complex, they all have vulnerabilities. And cybersecurity in many ways reduces to a constant race between the people at those companies and other white hat, you know, hacker security researcher folks trying to find those vulnerabilities to plug them. Um, and criminals and spy agencies and law enforcement uh, rushing to find those vulnerabilities and exploit them or sell them to people who can't exploit them. And so there is, at this point, a very large gray market in, for the sale of tools to break into computer systems uh, being sold by people who discovered them or bought them from someone who discovered them who, instead of disclosing them to be patched, decided to profit off them instead, which I think undermines all of our cybersecurity. Um, we saw some recent examples of this. Uh, we saw it in the Apple v versus FBI case, where the FBI actually bought uh, use of a tool that relied on an exploit that had not been disclosed to Apple. We saw it just last week in this story about three uh, iPhone zero days, that is exploits that were previously unknown, um, that had actually been sold to presumably the United Arab Emirates to uh, spy on a human rights defender there. And so, so one, there's a question about how much do we actually want our government participating in that market, recognizing that as far as we know right now, it is probably the largest buyer, and therefore, you know, probably the person, the, the, the party most facilitating the existence of this market, which in many ways is dangerous. Um, and then how do we want the government to handle it when it does have in its possession a vulnerability that impacts many of you? How long should they be able to keep using that in secret, if at all? When should they disclose it? Um, and so this is actually a subject of great debate right now. There is a process uh, an interagency process convened by the White House called the Vulnerability Equities Process, which means they are weighing the different equities, like the national security or law enforcement equity, the cybersecurity equity, this and that equity, to try and decide when to disclose vulnerabilities to the vendor or to the public and when to hold on to them. But it's a obscure, not transparent, at the will of the executive kind of process. And when we talk about things we want to codify and you know, bring out into the light and codify and expose and get transparency on, um, a big part of that is getting uh, a clear, strong vulnerability equities process so that we know that the government isn't hoarding lots of zero days that we should actually have get patched. Uh, which another piece of news relevant to this was recently the shadow brokers theft of NSA hacking tools revealed um, like a, a big zero day in Cisco routers. Like so much of our traffic depends on these Cisco routers and the NSA um, had this really big vulnerability for a long time. And like, do we want to allow that? How long do we want to allow that? That's another part of the big conversation that we actually really need to have uh, at a policy level that we, we haven't had yet. So I'm gonna go to the question in the back, but just real quick, 
Um, Kurt, because Kevin touched on the not transparency in how we deal with vulnerabilities equities, mm -hmm. can you spend like 20, 30 seconds and tell us how EFF knows there is not transparency because you had to litigate uh, about we're this? Indeed. So we, we use the Freedom of Information <coughs> Act uh, FOIA to uh, uh, ask the government for details about the uh, vulnerabilities equities process. Uh, and then they, uh, uh, well, they resisted providing full details on that. Uh, when we were able to successfully litigate to get, uh, it's still somewhat redacted, but a lot more information about this uh, this vulnerabilities equities uh, process. Uh, though uh, uh, we at least have the document that describes it, we don't have a whole lot of information uh, about how it has been used. The government on one hand has said that uh, uh, a large percentage of the vulnerabilities uh, they, they end up disclosing. On the other hand, when we've talked to people who work at technology companies who would be the recipients of uh, vulnerabilities disclosure, nobody, nobody seems to have gotten any. So uh, it, it's hard to uh, uh, get that. Yeah. Put Apple, Apple a couple of months ago noted that they finally got their first <laughs> bone from the FBI, and this is for a process that has supposedly been going on for years. So question in the back. Yes, so with regard to splitting the warrant into location and a more comprehensive search, is the advantage of that that the more comprehensive search would usually not be the same type of hacking that we've been talking about here, or is it some other advantage? I'd say one part of it is, one of the words haven't been stated yet, but a, a key concern we have about the rule is forum shopping, which is the idea of the government going to judges that know that it knows favor its equities, like judges that are most likely to give them what they want, um, judges that are not likely going to crack the whip. Um, and so part of the strategy, the, the idea behind limiting it to just what you need is so that you can only forum shop at that initial stage where you don't know where they are, but once you know where they are, you have to go to a judge in the actual district. Um, and so, so I think a part of it is it'll minimize forum trapping. There is another aspect, which is if it is actually an IP address in a particular district in the US that you're able to pinpoint to an address, actually, yes, like a better alternative at that point would be just go seize the computer rather than secretly hack into it. Um, and hopefully the judge that you go to would, would see that. So I, I want to add to that, uh, I mean, this, this is a real world issue. Uh, that uh, came out very uh, interestingly. In Riverside, California, there was a uh, magistrate judge who uh, was known to be a sort of a, a light touch on, on issuing wiretaps. And uh, <coughs> the DA uh, found their new favorite judge and some maybe quarter of all the wiretaps across the United States were being issued by one judge uh, who uh, they had a great relationship with. Yeah. Um, and this, this <coughs> is... I'm guessing it wasn't Judge Smith. It was not Judge Smith, uh, uh, and exactly there are the other Smith. right the opposite of Smith, uh, and uh, there, yeah there are certainly other judges that they like to uh, avoid. So form shopping is like a real thing. Uh, in the Apple case, which we'll talk about uh, uh, four o'clock uh, tomorrow in greater detail, um, the government had gotten another Apple case that existed earlier and got what I think they thought was a, a bad draw because that judge was questioning whether they had the power to mandate that Apple go into the phone. And uh, so, you know, uh, uh, another case uh, came came forward uh, in Riverside, though, wasn't wasn't going to the same judge that issued all the wiretaps. Mm -hmm. Question? Um, so back on the topic oh, of Sorry, back on the topic of the government hoarding zero days, it seems like that type of behavior would be able to be construed as damaging to anyone who owns those devices, but at the same time, it seems like it would be difficult for anyone to have actual standing to bring litigation to get them to disclose those zero days. So from a legal standpoint, like what would the actual framework to get that to stop other than an act of Congress be? I th so, I mean, one one of the architects of the current system, a guy named Ari Schwartz, uh, he used to be in our community uh, and then went to the White House to be cybersecurity director. He's now out, and he and a colleague have written a paper. He means out of the White House. Out of the White House. <laughs> uh, um, sorry, DC speak. Um, people go in and out of the government. Anyway, um, they, have, they have actually pushed, recognizing one, that Congress is unlikely to do anything helpful 
ever again, apparently. Um, uh, he at least would like to see them codify uh, a strong process in an executive order, uh, which, w which would be a bit more of a formal process. Um, uh, but yes, an act of Congress would as well. I think your standing question goes to the point, and this is, this is something that we have painful experience with in surveillance litigation, which is, okay, we know the surveillance is happening. We expect it's happening to masses of people. We don't have evidence actually connecting the surveillance to this individual. How do we get standing for that when it's secret? I think you would have a similar situation if someone tried to bring suit saying, I'm an iPhone user. I believe you're hoarding iPhone vulnerabilities, but I don't actually know. I don't know what you have. Um, but I want to sue you to stop it. I think a court would say you don't have evidence of standing there. I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the places where some of this will come up is uh, criminal defendants who are at, in trial and they're challenging the evidence being brought against them. Um, and uh, uh, the trouble with, with that is that, uh, um, you know, it may also be something that is disturbing or harmful or, or affects the, an innocent user. So if, if the government uses a, a, a tool to get on a completely innocent person's computer, that person will not get prosecuted, will might not even know that their computer had been attacked, and certainly uh, will be in a difficult position of asserting standing when they don't know about it. Uh, and so that means that the cases in which people, uh, the courts will be looking at it will tend to be ones in which is sort of the uh, uh, more less sympathetic facts, shall we say. Uh, he means child porn. Yes, well, that, that's where it's going to come up. Yeah, it's yeah. where it is coming up in a lot of cases right now. And courts don't like that for you know obvious reasons. Yeah. And uh, it tends to uh, result law. in, uh, uh, well, then the evidence is going to get in because you don't want this person out on the streets. Are there any other questions? There are three. Oh. One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> All right. When you describe what this rule is putting in place, I'm not completely familiar with the existing rules, but one of the concerns I hear is possibly legitimizing um, other mass hacking activities that have already been done by the NSA through the use of warrants. Could a warrant be issued if this rule goes through that doesn't have a specific target? I mean, obviously they don't have a name target because they wouldn't know that's the reason this rule is being changed. But for example, I believe less than a year ago, Carnegie Mellon was uh, revealed to have been uh, having uh, running tour servers that were um, being monitored by the FBI actively under FBI funding or I'm sorry that was an FBI I think, I think that might have been NSA but by a government agency under government funding could these warrants potentially be used to legitimize operations like that hold on one sec I'm going to take all three because we only have about 10 minutes left but I'm listing them down so I will make sure they all get answered uh, just a quick one is this uh, um relevant to the signal and all these people that are doing end-to-end -end encryption is that really relevant in the time frame that seems to be going on here all right and one more was over here i was just curious as to your opinions or or legal expertise as to how much do you think all of this that we've been talking about today that you guys have been talking about today is either fallout from or collateral damage of the patriot act all right, so we have a question on if you would be able to issue a warrant without a target, how this relates to end-to-end -end encryption and signal, and if it's related to the fallout from the Patriot Act. I got quick answers for all of those. Um, I think that on, on what you're describing, sir, that we have these things called anticipatory warrants, which make us very nervous, but basically where there's not a specific target, but rather it says, if these conditions are met, then you can search. And we have now seen that in this context at least twice. One, we saw it in something uh, called the playpen cases where uh, the FBI uh, took over and ran uh, for some period of weeks or months uh, a child porn site called playpen such that every time someone visited it, they placed a net to identify that person. And so they didn't know any who any of those people were. They didn't even have a name or a fake IP address or anything. Rather, they had a warrant for searching anyone who does visit this site in the future. Um, that's worrisome. It's arguably defensible in the sense that possession of child porn is a per se crime such that everyone visiting that site arguably was committing a crime. However, they also used a similar technique that infected everyone who used Tor Mail, which is the Tor based secure mail solution, which is indefensible. Um, on Signal, I think that 
it's orthogonal. I, I think this issue is re relevant to the extent that government hacking is now being discussed as an alternative to, say, mandating that Signal have a backdoor. Like, if, you know, and speaking generally, I would say, like, I would prefer, like, targeted hacking of bad guys' computers to breaking the network and having broad technological mandates uh, around encryption. Patriot Act, I think it's a follow-on only in the sense that Patriot Act created one of the key exceptions for extraterritorial, you know, extra district searching, which was terrorism. So it helped create a precedent for exceptions to the rule that you can only issue search warrants in your district. And so in that, in that sort of tenuous way, I think that Patriot sort of set, set this up. But otherwise, I don't really see a connection. Anything to add? Um, so I think that was a that was a good summary. Um, one thing I just wanted to add on sort of the the uh, you're talking about the whether the NSA will be using the Rule 41 uh, capabilities. Generally, when the NSA is trying to do this, if they go through a court at all, they go through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, which is a uh, a secret court. Uh, it it uh, no no uh, no observers are allowed. It meets inside a a, uh, a Faraday cage, uh, an electronically protected room that doesn't emit uh, radiation. That uh, is in the uh, the DC uh, courthouse, uh, and the orders that they issue. Uh, uh, well, in the in the, in, the uh, in many cases, they will be orders issued to uh, telecommunication service providers, internet service providers. Uh, they come with a, uh, a gag so those people can't talk about them. So there, there's a, like a whole set of, uh, of issues surrounding those orders. But generally the NSA wouldn't want to go uh, to a magistrate judge because it doesn't give them the assurances of secrecy. And what if they randomly got put in front of Judge Smith? They'd feel really weird about that. Um, so I'm not sure that these things are, are, are directly uh, related, but it is more giving a, a scope of, of power for domestic surveillance, and it could go beyond the, the FBI. It could be agencies like the DEA who would be using uh, Rule 41 uh, warrants with magistrates. Um, and then uh, uh, just a, a, a little thing on, uh, uh, on the signal um, that uh, uh, there are a lot of interesting issues there about whether or not uh, you can sort of what, what do you do with it with an order for a signal the, the the communications that you receive are end-to-end -end encrypted so uh, uh, a wiretap order will just get you a bunch of encrypted bits uh, and so the telecommunications provider say, oh here you go a bunch of encrypted bits good luck to you um, and uh, therefore there'll be an incentive to try to to get on to uh, the phone and to to uh, hack the endpoint uh, however um, hacking endpoints, uh, which are fully patched and up to date, um, uh, requires zero days generally, uh, and that is uh, pretty expensive. Uh, something that you know some agencies in the government will do, or if it's a high-profile thing like the uh, San Bernardino, Bernardino iPhone, they might they might do that and spend a million bucks on an exploit. But most of the network intrusion tools that uh, the FBI is using are not zero days. They are uh, known vulnerabilities have been out for a while and they're relying on the fact that people don't patch their computers very frequently. So by the way, patch your computer <laughs> frequently, uh, keep it up to date, make sure that if they want to go after you, at least they have to try hard. So I'm going to let them have closing statements, but just real quick, how many people use a Mozilla product so like Firefox? All right, so in your closing statements, if you could just <laughs> chat a little bit about how the VEP or disclosure or government hacking might have impacted a bunch of people in this room who use Firefox. That would be quite interesting. Take that one? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, so uh, Firefox, a uh, very popular browser, uh, and there have been uh, been times in which uh, the government has used uh, exploits uh, in the uh, against the Firefox browser uh, in order to get at, in particular, Tor users. Tor the anonymizing software uh, is built on top of uh, Mozilla's Firefox. Uh, and uh, therefore, even if Tor itself uh, is pretty solid, and it, it is, it's, it's a, a quite a good uh, protective program, if there is an exploit on the underlying thing, uh, then uh, uh, it, it still could be uh, potentially exploitable. Um, and so uh, uh, Mozilla is, is now aware that there have been several times where the product they're furnishing to uh, hundreds of millions of people and, and trying to make it as secure as possible 
uh, had vulnerabilities that the government knew about, and the government chose instead to, to exploit that rather than tell Mozilla about it, and the Mozilla public policy team has been very active on the vulnerabilities equities process. Cool. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a few things to Google for if you want to learn more. Um, actually, uh, uh, Kurt was just repeating some of the arguments earlier from a great blog post by his colleague Andrew Crocker, who also did a lot of that FOIA litigation he was talking about. If you just Google for EFF and government hacking, it'll be your first result. Uh, my organization, uh, the Open Technology Institute, just wrote a paper called Bugs in the System, uh, which addresses this sort of family of issues. So if you just Google for uh, OTI or Open Technology Institute and Bugs in the System, you'll find it. Um, but but in terms of my closing, I, I actually wanted to bring this back to, or to, science fiction. Um, I'm curious, how many of you have read uh, Ramez Nam's Nexus, or the related trilogy? Two, two gentlemen. I, I, I highly commend it. Ramez is an interesting fella. He was on the, uh, he was uh, a Microsoft engineer for 13 years. Uh, you know, he worked on some products uh, that you like and some products that you don't, um, like Internet Explorer and, and, and Outlook. And he wrote this trilogy recently because, um, you know, he was, he was an engineer at Microsoft, but he really wanted to be a science fiction writer, don't we all? And he went ahead and did it, and he wrote a first book, Nexus, ended up being a trilogy, uh, centered around this technology, Nexus, which is basically a like nanotechnological drug that allows you to network your thoughts with other people. Um, and so you can do sort of matrixy stuff like downloading skills and knowledge. You can, you can create group minds with other people. You can experience other things that other people are experiencing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Basically it is internet enabling your brain, which is like awesome and science fiction, but not crazy science fiction because he actually has a great afterward where he talks about some of the real world neuroscience stuff like paralyzed people being able to move robot arms with their with their with their minds or um, blind people who who have their sight like uh, restored by piping electronical signals directly into their brain or or the guy the two researchers there was, this is my favorite where one guy is watching a game a video while the other guy has the controller uh, and is watching the game and when the controller guy wants to do something he would think about pressing the controller and it would send a signal to the other guy who would get the signal and like shoot or move or whatever anyway um but so but imagine like it's a good thought experiment if your brain were internet enabled what would you think about this issue how would you feel about the government secretly downloading malware into your brain sure that's crazy right now sure it's science fiction right now but one it's not so crazy it might even be inevitable if we survive um but even if we don't, like even if that doesn't happen, like all good science fiction, it's a metaphor for where we are now because our brains are basically internet enabled. Our, our devices are like our offboard brains. They have everything about us on them. And so help activists like these two protect your outboard brain and get engaged on these issues and start by activating on Rule 41. Because again, it is going to be very hard to get Congress to move here. But the more we can show that people care about this issue now, the more likely it is we will get hearings and eventually some kind of reform and accountability. So thanks. Um, just real quick, uh, my organization also has a report coming out on Tuesday on government hacking and human rights. Also, EFF has a website called noglobalwarrants.org. If you want to join us, who those of us who still hold out hope that Congress can do something and take action to tell them to stop Rule 41, you can go to noglobalwarrants.org and contact your representative or your senator and tell them to support the SMH Act, really easy to remember, SMH Act, um, in order to stop Rule 41 from going forward. And we're out of time. Join me in thanking these two gentlemen to my right. And thank you thank all you. for coming. Thank you.